Welcome everybody to the University of Applied Research and Development's Emergency Response and Risk Management Podcast. I'm delighted to have with me George Gardner, who's a coach in safety and performance for GGG Consulting Services. We're delighted to have you with us, George. George was previously in the Royal Engineers, and so I know that he has a wealth of experience that he can share with us today. George, good to see you. Good to be here, Craig. Thanks. Why don't you tell us about what you're doing now? your role you have? Okay, well, up until coronavirus, <laughs> I was working in Qatar. So uh, my current role is a safety and performance coach. So on the drilling installations that we go on to, the drilling contractor has traditionally provided their own health and safety person, which is a role I used to perform uh, working for a couple of drilling companies when I first started in the industry. Laterally, the, the client, so that's your, uh, your majors, the people who hire the drilling vessel, they were putting their own safety person on there as well, so pr- providing additional health and safety cover. And the role I'm doing now is health and safety coach, and so it's overseeing the effectiveness, basically, of uh, the health and safety from all aspects. So it's more of a observation and like a sounding board and trying to provide impartial advice to people like the the company man you know the client representative all the way through uh, basically you know monitoring because every single person is expected to be responsible for safety on the installations so therefore trying to coach supervisors to have effective safety conversations with their people uh, coaching them into having proper and effective risk assessments and toolbox talks, because basically that's where your operational integrity comes from. It's every single person on that installation knowing their part, and basically having the culture that allows people to put their hand up and say, actually, I don't know that. Can we stop and uh, spend a bit more time on that? So, that, so tell me, what are some of the things, way. George, what are some of the things that... Um, that when you're talking with these um, these supervisors, the things that you coach them in looking for? <clears throat> I, I suppose the industry, even in my short time in here, it's looking at the way it's evolved because I can remember some of the first toolbox talks. You're looking at a risk assessment that's maybe 10, 15 pages long and they go through the risk assessment and get to the end so they could just get on with the job. Culturally, now we want it broken down into stages because you can't take that whole 15-page risk assessment and absorb that, so we do the job in stages. So it's small steps. So it's making sure supervisors have that conversation in small enough steps, taking it in. Are they actually using the confirmation process? You know, because it's very easy to give your little talk and then say, everybody okay, and they all nod their head and walk off. And you can guarantee guys are walking away saying, what was that all about? So it's making sure we've got the confirmation process right. And again, culturally, people are not afraid to say, actually, could you go over that again, please? Right. So that, that's probably the, the biggest single thing. And I was out of the industry for three years before coming back in. And even in that three years, you can see a massive change in the way that onshore management actually function because one of the things is you need to have a culture whereby you're not afraid to tell onshore management the things that are going wrong. If we try and present them too rosy a picture, um, they they have no idea where the problems are and therefore they can't help. So grown-up management really is all about being them saying, look, tell us what your problems are and we'll do what we can to support and help you. So how long are your um, deployments, for want of a better word, uh, when you go out and you do contracting? When you go international, it's usually 28 days. So 28 on, 20 off. Okay. In the UK, the shift pattern varies. It could be two weeks on, two weeks off, three on, three off, two on, three off. There's a variety of different systems out there. But international tends to be 28 and 28. So what, for your role, what sort of um, historic um, experiences that you've gone through do you think have prepared you really well for the role you're doing right now? 
Uh, I come from, well, you've been a Kiwi, uh, a nation of five million people, a lot of small towns, and uh, the area I grew up in was actually very prominently fishing. So, uh, I don't know, I suppose there's an element of being self-sustained, you know, your small communities. Mm. I never fancied the fishing, so I ended up going into the army. And uh, mm. a lot of my friends went from the fishing street into the oil industry. I went into the army, and after the army, into the fire service, and then into the oil and gas industry. So quite a long way, quite a long way around to meet guys you went to school with on a vessel like two thousand miles from home. It's funny, but um, I, I suppose the thing that changed me as a person was going into the army. I did active service tours of Northern Ireland and the first Gulf War. So, <clears throat> yeah, you just, it teaches you a lot about yourself, I suppose. Um, in terms of incident command stuff, I probably got most of that experience in the fire service. So I did 12 years in the fire service and uh, there was a couple of big incidents where I was part of an incident command structure, you know, and you could see the, you could see how the structure was set up and how it how it worked, um, and again, I suppose that's where monitoring the effectiveness of your people comes in, because, you know, just thinking back to one incident where I was part of a breathing apparatus crew, and we were standing by for half an hour. And they actually recommitted the same team three times, but they didn't use the resources they had. You know, we teams standing by waiting, and they ended up having guys come out, change a cylinder, and go back in again, which is a you know ineffective use of resources. So just incident command's a big thing. It's a big thing, but everybody needs to know their part in it, and somebody needs to be making sure the system's used effectively. You know, you're using your resources efficiently. Okay, so that's a really good learning to make sure you're using the resources efficiently. What are some of the other learnings or epiphanies that you had um, while you spent 12 years in the fire service? Um, <clears throat> I spent six years in the training department. and When I did my training and joined the fire service, my experience of the training was we wanted to make people really hot and uncomfortable to show how tough we were. And there was, it wasn't really an efficient learning process. So when we went to our training center to do annual sort of refresher training, they threw us in to this thing, this, this hot unit that we had, got us really hot, came, came out and told us a list of things we, went, we did wrong in their eyes, and then sent us off and like, come back and do it again next year. So, there wasn't much in the way of coaching or mentoring or effective training. So when I became a training officer, my thought process was if, if they're doing that wrong, we need to stop them and get them into the habit of doing it properly. Even little things like going through a door, you're supposed to go through a door very carefully. You don't want to open it, allow air in, which could theoretically cause you know, an ignition and end up with a backdraft coming out through that door. So you open the door carefully, you go through it as quickly as possible, and you close that door so that you're not changing the conditions within that environment. So that's how we need to teach people. And the old school instructors used to go straight in behind the breathing apparatus crews, and they would close the door for them. So someone as simple as that. These people aren't getting in the habit of actually closing the door behind them. So teaching our instructors, look, Get in there and wait. Monitor them coming in. Don't close the door for them. Just follow them through. We should be unobtrusive. We had to learn to be, you know, they should know we're there. We're just monitoring from a position of safety. So that that was probably my biggest, my biggest epiphany is we need to train people how we expect them to function in a real life scenario. Mm, interesting. Okay. There is there is a. A search process, effectively, you should clear each space before you move through into the next one. And human behavior, people are lazy. The majority of fires we attend would be domestic. So you could, 
reasonably assume you could go through every door you come across on your way through that building and cover most of the house. And that's, it. that's what happened in real life fires. We didn't clear rooms efficiently and effectively. And there was an incident in Dundee where a woman died. And the fire service had told her, because you can call the fire service, and they said, get to a window, and we've got fire crews on the way, they'll find you. So she followed the advice, she stayed at the window, and two, two search teams went in, they searched that entire flat, came out, and didn't find anybody. It was only when the fire was out and they were ventilating the place, they found this young woman behind the curtains, close to the window, and she died of smoke inhalation. So the Scottish Fire Service went through this process in room clearance. We've got to drive it into people. You clear each compartment before you move on. So that was my first year as an instructor in the training department, trying to, trying to teach 30, 40 year firemen that uh, what they've been doing up until now is wrong. You know, so uh, <laughs> that was uh, 12 months of headache, extremely confrontational. Uh, but ultimately it came down to the fact that because these people didn't follow procedures, they didn't carry out our laid down processes effectively and properly, somebody had died. You couldn't get away from that. So uh, that, was, that was a really, really challenging <laughs> uh, learning. But you have to do it right. And you, we've got to teach people not to drop their standards. That's the important thing. I can imagine that was really difficult. How how have you managed stress and the difficulties of your roles? That particular one where I was an instructor, because uh, I'd only been in the fire service six years at that point, so I'm speaking to people who have got a lot more seniority and hmm. experience than me, but it came down to sim the sim you can't argue <laughs> with a simple fact that if you don't, go around that and you can give them any number of scenarios where using their search pattern you would have missed parts of the building you know so uh, managing stress really you've you've got to know what you're talking about for a start if you don't know something you hold up your hands and say I don't know uh, trying to bluff is massively stressful so knowing your material being open and engaging doing your best to work in a collaborative manner. And again, the oil industry is fantastic for that. Uh, it, certainly, the, the journey this came on, and where, where they are now, I would have to say the project that I joined in Qatar, uh, the most, it's probably the most emotionally intelligent group of people I've ever worked with. Uh, it, was ex it was extremely enlightening to join that project. It was amazing. But... Uh, yeah, stress management is, is really about awareness, isn't it? And actually just really caring about people. Uh, if you work in an environment where you don't feel people particularly care about you, you don't feel you're understood, listened to, um, you don't feel like you're actually making a difference, all those things contribute to stress. Um, Again, coming from the oil industry, I spent three years back in manufacturing, and I'll be perfectly honest, I found that stressful. <laughs> Not because it was a dangerous environment, but because it was a 1960s factory with a 1960s managerial mindset, and it was impossible to make progress. So uh, an extremely safe job, but far more stressful than any other one I've done for a while, simply because of the culture within that environment. So you've mentioned culture so, quite a few times about the ability to um, get the confirmation, to get confirmation and to um, ask questions. What are some other things that make a culture good and safe? Um, again, related to the oil industry, actually believing that your managers and your supervisors mean what they say. You know, if, if they're telling us that we care, there's a difference between parroting, parroting things that are 
you know, and, and the company value list. Oh. I'll be there in a minute, Alan. Uh, yeah, there's a difference between parroting things that are on the list and actually making people believe it. You know, people have got to believe, and you've still been being consistent in your decision making. It means, um, you hear you hear phrases: walk the walk, talk the talk, blah blah. blah. Walking the talk is the difference, isn't it? Um, you've got to be seen to be doing the right thing all the time. We can't pick and choose the bits of the company management system, the, the procedures, the things that we like. It's got to be consistent. And you've got to be able to hold your hands up if, if you find out, if somebody pulls you up for deviating from that, it's like, okay, fair enough, yeah. I need to, I need to reassess. So cultures, you know, you, you spend a long time trying to build a culture and you can lose it very easily. Um, by not doing the right thing just this one time. So culture is all about being consistent. It's about doing the right thing. It's about making sure you're seen to do the right thing as well. So um, integrity, doing the right thing when nobody's watching, you know. Nice. That's a big word, integrity. Hey, George, um, just to wrap up, those are some really good points that I wrote down from what you've shared. For someone who's a recent graduate, maybe doing one of our programs or someone looking to get into the industry, particularly in emergency response, what would be some experiences or some wisdom that you would encourage them to get before they enter or as quickly as possible? We've got two ears and one mouth for a reason. So if we listen twice as much as we speak, you know, when we speak, we're only confirming things that we know. When we listen, we're going to be learning. So you'll be able to pick up learnings from everybody right through any installation that you step onto. Even even the roustabouts have had life experience before they they came onto an oil rig. You know, so wherever you go, speak to people. You'll be able to draw on their experiences, even if it's only to confirm to yourself, "I'm never going to do that." But uh, speak to people, and that that's it. being a safety person. Like for me, it's easy. I actually don't need to know anything. Honestly, I, you, you just walk up to people and say, I've never done your job, mate. Go and tell me what you're doing. How could you get hurt in your job? What controls do you have in place? Is there anything that you've seen anywhere else that could actually make this job easier? And there you go. I've just made you a safety person in 30 seconds. That's, that's really what you, you need to do. And it works right through life, whatever job whatever job, whatever role you're undertaking, speak to people like that. Get them to tell you about it because people want to tell you. People want to do a good job. Nobody ever wants to get hurt. Nobody ever wants to do something badly. It's sometimes we end up in a situation without fully understanding why. And the more people we can have looking out for us and prompting us to make sure we've actually done the right things, the safer our operations will be. Nice. That's great. Hey, George, I really want to thank you for your time and appreciate your wisdom and sharing your experiences with us. Thank you, Craig. Hope I was of some use to somebody there anyway. Thank you so much. 